Well, let's uh, start here with just a brief reminder uh, concerning the characteristics of wave propagation across a boundary. We've, uh, we've got these two, two layers, or media, uh, medium 1 and 2, layer 1 and 2. Uh, they have different velocities and densities, rho 1, v1, rho 2, v2. And um, we're assuming that the, their, their product, the acoustic impedance, is also different. In other words, z1 is uh, not equal to z2, so we have a difference in acoustic impedance above and below this interface. We could imagine a trivial case where we could have different uh, densities and velocities and yet their products could be the same but uh, we're assuming that Z1 and Z2 are, are significantly different from each other. We've also been talking about these pro properties of the wavefront, the uh, pressure uh, disturbance which is uh, propagating down through the subsurface and also the particle velocities or the displacement of particles from their equilibrium position as the wave propagates uh, uh, through the subsurface. So, so we have these different uh, parameters that we're working with. And we noted that we could come up with quantities that we refer to as the reflection coefficient and the transmission coefficient. We have a reflection coefficient for the pressure. So we have a certain pressure disturbance, which is incident on the boundary, and a certain fraction of that pressure is reflected back towards the surface, and a certain fraction of that incident pressure is uh, transmitted through the interface uh, deeper into the subsurface. Uh, the amount reflected was Z2 minus Z1 over Z1 plus Z2, and T sub P was equal to 2Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. And we had uh, uh, similar quantities for the uh, re reflected uh, particle velocity and the transmitted particle velocities. So we can see that uh, R sub P and R sub V, if we multiply R sub V by a minus 1, we get Z2 minus Z1. So we can see that uh, R sub P is equal to minus R sub V, or R sub V is equal to minus R sub P, so we have this relationship here. Uh, we also have that the transmission coefficient, we went through a little bit of algebra, we showed that uh, T sub V would be equal to 1 plus R sub V, and T sub P would be equal to 1 plus R sub P. So given those relationships uh, between R sub V and R sub P, uh, we can determine T sub V, and R sub V directly from R sub P. So all we need to know is R sub P. If we know R sub P, we can determine R sub V. Uh, T sub V is going to be 1 plus R sub V. T sub P, we don't actually have to calculate this. T sub P is simply 1 plus R sub P. So this gives rise to a bit of uh, what, what may seem like an enigma, and that is that the, you know, we, we expect that the reflected and transmit, we, we, we expect that we're going to have conservation of energy, and that the reflected and transmitted energy should be equal to the incident uh, energy, or that the energy uh, above the interface should be equal to the energy below the, inter the, below the interface, or that uh, uh, the uh, uh, reflected and the transmitted uh, energy should be equal to the incident energy, so they'd be partitioned. So this relationship here, though, makes us scratch our head, uh, especially if R sub P, the reflection coefficient for the pressure disturbance, as an example, is greater than 1, then we have T sub P, or is, great, is um, a positive number, then we have T sub P is equal to 1 plus R sub P, which is greater than 1. So it seems to defy this energy requirement. But keep in mind that we're talking about amplitudes and um, a balance between pressure and particle velocities above and below the interface. And uh, we should also keep in mind that we're, we've made a couple special uh, assumptions about the uh, characteristics of wave propagation. That is that we're dealing with a plane wave disturbance and that there is no attenuation or conversion of mechanical energy into heat energy as the wave propagates. So. Now, we can meet the conditions for the plane wave by assuming that we're looking very locally here at a 
point on the wave front. We know that the energy, the actual energy created at the source is being distributed on an ever increase in an increasingly large area on this expanding wave front. But we're looking very locally here. So the distance from the source is assumed to be fairly large. The curvature is assumed to be fairly small. So we're neglecting this um, distribution of energy out along this wave front. And so that gives us uh, our plane wave. It gives us an approximation to our plane, plane wave. So we're just looking locally here. And we also assume that the propagation distances of interest to us as we go from one layer to the next, that these boundaries are also fairly local in extent, and that we can ignore the attenuation losses, uh, again, that conversion of mechanical energy to heat energy. So these are a couple uh, assumptions, and, and these are um, ways that we can envisage that the um, uh, situation that we're dealing with is, a, is an approximation, but it's, it would be a good approximation. And here we want to consider, okay, what is the energy on the wave front? And uh, energy, remember, is the work required to displace particles. You know, we're, we've got media here which are composed, we can think of it as being composed of car particles or grains or crystals. And we're displacing those uh, particles from their equilibrium position. We're also changing the pressure. So we're doing two things. We're displacing particles. We're also changing pressures. And we also know that this uh, wave front that we're talking about, uh, if you go back to our discussions of the development of the wave equation, you know that the uh, wave front, the, the disturbance that is propagating through the subsurface continues for some uh, period of time. So it doesn't happen instantaneously. So uh, uh, if we use pressure and particle velocity, it's easy to describe energy transfer in terms of work or energy expended on unit area per unit time, or the power expended on unit area. So we're just coming back to some basic, basic definitions that you're, you're familiar with. So if we take a look at the product of particle velocity, let's say the incident, particle, the incident pressure and particle velocity, this will be the pressure term, the force divided by the area, force per unit area. And this would be the particle velocity, and we're using chi as the particle displacement, so we have d chi dt. And this would also be, we could rewrite this now as just e over a dt. This would be the power, e over dt, the power transferred per unit area. I didn't want to write p again here to confuse the power with uh, pressure. So we have this uh, power transfer, transferred per unit uh, area. And so the conservation of energy requirement is that the energy in the reflected and the transmitted wave equals the incident energy. And we had this uh, relationship here where we had the, uh, these two terms on one side of the boundary and uh, this term on the other side. So we had P sub I. Uh, v, this is one of the boundary conditions that we worked with earlier. We have P, the product P sub I, V sub I plus P sub R, V sub R should be equal to P sub T, V sub T. But we can uh, take the uh, P sub R, V sub R term over to, we can subtract P sub R, v, v sub R from both sides of this equation. And we get that P sub I, V sub I is equal to P sub T, V sub T minus P sub R, V sub R. And we expect that the incident pressure and particle velocity is going to be partitioned into a transmitted pressure and particle velocity and a reflected pressure and particle velocity. And so if we divide both sides of this equation by P sub I V sub I, we get 1 over here. We have 1 is equal to P sub T V sub T over P sub I V sub I minus P sub R V sub R over P sub I V sub I. And I think you'll see some familiar looking terms. In, in these ratios, we have uh, P sub T over P sub I would be the transmission coefficient for the uh, pressure disturbance. V sub T over V sub I would be the transmission coefficient for the uh, particle velocity uh, disturbance. 
and so on. So this equation that we came up with here can be transformed into this equation over here where we have t sub p, t sub v, these two ratios, t sub p, t sub v, minus r sub p, r sub v, because these are the p sub r over p sub i would be the reflection coefficient for the particle pressure, or the uh, pressure, and v sub r over v sub i would be the reflection coefficient for velocity. So using these relationships between r and uh, t, we can rewrite all of this, we can rewrite this equation over here. We know that t sub p is equal to 1 plus r sub p, P, uh, T sub V is equal to 1 plus R sub V, but we know that R sub V is equal to minus R sub P. R sub V is equal to minus P, R sub P here, so that gives us a plus R sub P squared. So we have this, uh, these two terms uh, just going through the algebra here uh, using, that, uh, using those definitions that we developed earlier. And then carrying through with the algebra, we have 1 plus R sub P minus r sub p minus r sub p squared plus r sub p squared is equal to 1. So the partition um, transmitted and reflected power per unit time, power per unit area, I should change that to unit area, is equal to the incident uh, power per unit area. So just make a note there that uh, that's uh, power is energy expended per unit uh, time and uh, so we're talking about power per unit area. So I'm, I'm going to uh, leave you with a problem here. And uh, we're going to revise our, revise our notation so that we can indicate from which layer, uh, we're, which layer we're reflecting off of and in which direction. So if we have the reflection coefficient for pressure, we've always been thinking, oh, okay, well that goes upward, goes towards the surface. So, but we can also think of this as the reflection coefficient for pressure from layer one to layer two. In other words, layer one on the top and layer two on the bottom. Now, if we have reflected uh, pressure coming up from a reflection from a deeper interface, then we also realize that a certain fraction of that uh, pressure disturbance, which is rising up towards the surface, is going to be reflected back down into the subsurface from this interface. And this reflection coefficient would be r sub p21. And r sub p21 would just be equal to minus r sub p12. We just reversed the, uh, the velocities in the, uh, in the numerator. So, so that just changes the sign. And likewise, for transmission, we could have transmission um, for the downgoing wave uh, from layer 1 to layer 2, identified as T sub P12. And then for these wave fronts that are coming up from deeper reflections from deeper layers, we'll have a certain fraction of that uh, disturbance transmitted into the overlying layer. So this would be T sub P from layer 2 into layer 1. So these terms are defined down here. We have r sub p, and I think the definitions are fairly fairly obvious. We have r sub p21 is equal to minus r sub p12. And we have t sub p12 equal to 1 plus r sub p12. So we're just using some familiar definitions. Uh, t sub p21 would be equal to 1 plus r sub p21, but r sub p21 is equal to minus r sub p12. So this is equal to 1 minus r sub p12. So the problem I'm going to leave you with is a numerical one. Uh, we have uh, given densities in layers 1 and 2. We have diff given velocities, uh, 3,505 meters per second, 5,640 meters per second, and so on. And so with these givens, um, what I'd like for you to do is uh, calculate the two-way transmission loss. Assume that uh, a perfect reflector underlies the boundary between layers 1 and 2. Uh, 
so that all the incident energy on this interface here is reflected back up and through the interface to a receiver which is located at the surface. So whatever hits this interface, all of that uh, pressure and particle velocity disturbance is transmitted back towards the uh, surface. And so the problem is, assume that you have an incident wave with an amplitude 1. And it's transmitted through the boundary between layers 1 and 2 and reflected back to the surface from this perfect reflector down here. And then there are three questions for you to consider. Uh, what is the amplitude of the wave returned to the surface? What's the amplitude of the wave that uh, comes back up from this perfect reflector? And through this inter interface, we know that there's going to be a certain amount transmitted going in down direction and also in the upward direction. The second part of the problem is the just to note that the two-way transmission amplitude is a product of the upgoing and downgoing transmission amplitudes. We just noted that we have a certain amount of energy is going down. That would be the transmitted, downward transmitted particle velocity and pressure. And we have an upward transmitted particle velocity and pressure. And show that that is equivalent to an energy ratio. And then finally, what is the energy loss associated with two-way transmission through the boundary? So these are three questions. Um, have a look at that and um, think about this a bit. And uh, we'll come back to this in the next video. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.